gentlemen, please get up. We are truly privileged to have with us our next speaker, Professor Patrick Stokes, Associate Professor of Philosophy, Associate Head of School, International and Engagement, School of Humanities and Social Sciences, Deakin University, to address all of us. Thank you very much for having me here today. It's a delightful uh, privilege to be here. My name is Patrick Stokes. I'm a philosopher and uh, I'm a philosopher of uh, death and a philosopher of personal identity. Not particularly a philosopher of the internet or a philosopher of technology, but nonetheless, uh, the online space is one in which questions of death and personal identity have become particularly salient and particularly around the question of what happens to the traces that we leave behind online after we die. What is the ethical status of these uh, traces? What should we do with them? And is there such a thing as a kind of digital reincarnation that's available to us? Or could there be such a thing? And if there is, is it something we should want, something we should fear, or something we should actively work to even prevent or avoid? Now, as I say, this is a, a topic that I became interested in um, some years ago. In fact, I think it was about 10 years ago now. Um, at the time, just by way of a little bit of, of explanation, I was living overseas. And uh, I was finding that, um, social media and particularly Facebook and other sorts of platforms like that had become for me an important part of how I was present in the lives of my friends and family back home and they in my life. And around that time, about 10 years ago, I also started to notice that people I knew to have died were still present in social media. And I wasn't the only person who noticed this, not by a long shot. We don't to this day know exactly how many dead people there are on the internet, but we know the number is gonna be many, many millions. As long ago as 2012, we know that it was about 30 or 40 million people, and it's now gonna be an exponentially larger number than that. The one certainty of the dead, of course, is that numbers grow every single year. And of course, this was inevitable, that as soon as we started to spend more and more of our life online, more and more people who were online were going to die and leave things like social media accounts, email accounts, and other kinds of digital legacy uh, online. Uh, that was then gonna be a problem for the rest of us to work out what we we're gonna do about that. And certainly technology companies found that they had to make up policies for how to deal with the digital dead more or less on the go. That is that they didn't really have a template for what to do in these situations. When, for instance, people started to contact um, Facebook. I, I use Facebook as a bit of a, a default example just because it's so pervasive. But of course, 10 years from now, that may sound quaint or unintelligible to people because the tech space moves so fast. But um, what started to happen uh, was that users began to die and their next of kin began to contact the tech companies to say that, you know, this person has died. Uh, can you please delete their account because we find it unnerving that it's still there or we find it distressing when we see them or we don't mean to see them or uh, could you please preserve their account because we hate the thought that all of their material all of their photos and text and all the things that they've said to us over the years and all those conversations we've had could just vanish at the click of a button uh, and of course sometimes you get um, disagreements within say a family or disagreements within a community as to what should be done, how those digital remains, and I'll say more about that phrase in a minute, um, should be managed. So you, you start to have these disagreements uh, as to how these things should be dealt with. You start to have as well, um, interesting uh, problems with the platforms themselves starting to be invasive in people's lives. One of the first things that happened, of course, was that Facebook used to send you these messages saying, hey, you haven't spoken to your friend such and such in a while. Why don't you drop them a line? Or, hey, here's someone you might know. And of course, sometimes those people were dead, unknown to Facebook and unknown to um, the service providers. And this was actually quite distressing for some users. And so they found that they had to, uh, organizations like Facebook found that they had to come up with uh, uh, basically internal policies and procedures around this stuff. So it creates challenges for individuals, for families, for companies, but also for governments. And this is something that a lot of governments are now dealing with. What are the digital privacy rights of the dead, if any? And of course, in many countries, the dead have no privacy rights. In other countries, the dead do have privacy rights. So what sort of privacy should the dead be afforded? Should their emails be accessible to their next of kin, for instance? Um, what about, you know, uh, passwords to uh, various online platforms we might need access to? Should the dead as next of kin or executors have access to that? 
what should the status of the sort of uh, legacy contacts that people leave now through various platforms be? Should people through their wills be able to determine what is done with their digital remains? Uh, now, one of the things that's worth noting here, of course, is that uh, there is for tech companies, at least a short term commercial imperative to preserve the digital dead. Why is that? Because the dead are actually pretty good for business, at least in the short term. Because people continue, and this is something that a lot of uh, psychologists and sociologists who have studied the digital death space have found, people continue to go back to the profiles of the dead and to interact with them. So people will, for instance, go to a dead person's Facebook profile, let's say, and leave messages on anniversaries, say the anniversary of their death or their birthday or other significant dates. And really interestingly, they'll address the dead in second person. That is, they'll say things like, I can't believe you've been gone so many years. I wish you could see how big little Billy is now. It just doesn't feel the same without you. They say these things directly to the dead, actually not dissimilar to the ways in which we've um, often spoken to the dead at gravesides when we find ourselves just, you know, talking to the dead, if you do that. Um, people are doing that in the online space now, uh, in this mediated sort of way. And of course, all the time that people are doing that, they're spending more time on the platform. So there is actually a, a commercial imperative, at least in the short term, for tech companies to preserve these digital remains, to preserve the digital dead. And we might think, well, that's a good thing. After all, it's good that this information is not lost to us in the same way that it would be a shame if uh, material that might be valuable to um, families on a sentimental level, but also to historians someday, that it might be fantastic to have this archive of how we lived and of everything that we said and thought and, and the way in which we presented ourselves to the world available um, for future study. But long term, of course, there are serious economic infrastructure and particularly environmental concerns around preserving the digital dead. To preserve uh, the data that we leave behind requires service space, it therefore requires electricity, it requires infrastructure. Uh, and of course, it's entirely reasonable for these companies to one day say, well, hang on, we didn't sign up to be the archive of humanity. We didn't sign up to be a virtual graveyard. We just signed up to be a social network service. So we're going to delete the digital dead because it is taking up too much room on our server, too much electricity, too much cost. So there are serious ethical questions around whether we are obliged to preserve the digital dead and who should pick up the cost. Now I use that phrase digital remains and this is a term that a lot of sociologists and anthropologists and psychologists working in this space have begun to use. But as a philosopher, I think it's also a useful way of thinking about some of the ethical questions around what we do with the digital dead. And also importantly, some of the, what as a philosopher I'd like to call metaphysical or ontological questions. That is questions around what exists online, what these uh, digital remains are and what we should therefore be doing with them. So it's a metaphor, digital remains, in the same way that say literary remains is a metaphor that we use for the writings that say an author leaves behind after they die. But while it is a metaphor, I don't know that we should be treating it just as a metaphor. As a philosopher, I think there can be things that exist in between the strictly literal and the merely figurative or merely metaphorical. I think that it's actually a really useful metaphor for trying to understand what we leave behind online. Philosophers of information, I'm thinking particularly here of my colleague um, from uh, some years ago at Hertfordshire, Luciano Floridi, who's probably the leading philosopher of information, have argued that in important senses, some of our data is not just information about us, but is in fact partially constitutive of us. There is some data that is constitutive of who we are and of our identity. And if that wasn't the case, it'd be very hard to make sense of the kind of violation that we feel when our, da um, our data is uh, invaded or the privacy around our data is invaded. Some kinds of data seem to be actually constitutive of who we are. And in particular, I think that's true of things like our social media profiles, because these are increasingly part of our face, part of how we are present to the world, how we are present in the lives of other people. And of course, these last couple of years during the, the COVID-19 pandemic, that's been even more saliently true because of course, more and more of our lives, we are only present in each other's lives uh, through digital mediation. 
and these platforms that we use have become more and more just a part of our face of, of, of how we are present in other people's lives and how we are in fact embodied in other people's lives. Uh, and so if we are our data, then it seems like our digital remains are our remains in a more than merely metaphorical sense. They are in a sense, part of our body that is left behind after we die, part of our face that is left behind after we die. And that is going to change how we think about the ethical status of digital remains and of what we should do with the things that we leave behind online. Why? Because, well, we don't have property rights in corpses. You might inherit your great aunt's house, you might inherit her car, you might inherit her pet parrot, but you don't inherit her corpse. What you have over her corpse are rights and obligations of disposal. And um, you, you have a certain right, if you like, that we should be thinking of not in terms of property, but in terms of stewardship. And as uh, some commentators like Jed Brubaker have argued, that's what we need to be thinking of with the digital debt, thinking in terms of stewardship of the dead. So, but what about digital immortality? This is a prop, uh, something that has been heavily discussed in the literature is can we actually live on through online formats and who has a right to do that and in fact a number of um, startup companies over the years have been trying to do that uh, trying to set up platforms through which you can um, continue to exist as an AI chatbot this was originally just fiction like in the 2014 TV program Black Mirror the episode be right back of that series uh, where a man is brought back to life through his online um, traces that he leaves after he dies. Then in 2018, it was done for real when a man named Roman Mazarenko died and his best friend turned him into a chatbot, which you can now download and chat with online. Now, these raise a series of important, shall we say, uh, philosophical questions around um, survival online. And, you know, is it possible for us to live on in this format? Well, short answer, no for ourselves. There's nothing you can look forward to in being a chatbot. But equally, yes, in the sense that if we leave sufficiently good AI chatbots behind, it's possible that people will come to see those as extensions of our personality, as extensions of the dead, that they may actually come to fulfill some of the same roles in um, this new format that the dead fulfilled while they were alive. I find that deeply troubling. And I think that what we need to be having now are serious discussions on a legislative level and on a, a, an economic and social level about who can actually reuse these digital remains, what they can be reused for, and who has the final say and final control over that. This is a rare occasion where I think we can actually get ahead of the technology before it gets here and work out ethically what we want to permit it to do before it's actually started to operate. We need to be talking about what digital reincarnation might be possible and what we are going to permit in this space because we need to be standing up for and protecting the dead from the living. Thanks very much. Thank you so much, sir, for that extraordinary speech and insights. Truly an eye-opening session, and I'm sure we all have learned a lot. Well, ladies and gentlemen, with that, we come to the end of today's summit. We would once again like to thank all of you for joining us and adding so much of value with your great presence. We would like to once again thank our esteemed partners, our presenting partner, Kimbrel, co-powered by IBM, our innovation partner, Dell Technologies, our platinum partners, Cloudflare, Comvault, and Hitachi Pantara. Our gold partners, Manage Engine, Microfocus, STGDC, Tata Communications, VMware, and Wise Tech. And finally, our associate partner, TechWay, for extending their immense support and making today's summit a huge success. We hope this summit has been absolutely instrumental and enriching for all of you, and we look forward to invite the learning shared by all the esteemed speakers. Feel free to share your experiences, highlights of your learnings on your social media about today's summit using the hashtag that is hashtag ETBTS. Visit our lead, leaderboard terms and conditions for more information and knowledge. Engage with all the elements. Everything leads you to ramp up your leaderboard scores. So let's make that happen. We have some exclusive Amazon gift vouchers to be given to all of you, which is stolen absolutely for you. So please go ahead and ensure that you're applying and following the guidelines. With that, ladies and gentlemen, this is your host, Project Tabagat, officially signing off. Thank you so much.